life. Here we are. Right. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting that it always puts a smile on our face. <laughs> it's always so loud and so uh, boisterous. I don't know. <laughs> Abdul. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Um, what I will say before Abdul comes back on, just I guess while the live stream is, is beginning, um, just to summarize what we've been talking about for anybody listening, that um, um, that uh, we brought up a few definitions of cosmopolitanism, including diversity, a sense of a place with a diverse group of people, um, uh, connecting with others, treating others as you would like to be treated or treating others as, um, which is an interesting, I don't know if there's a historical context of how that developed into the Christian um, uh, philosophy of treating others as you would like to be treated. I'm not sure if there's a connection there, but something for later later research. Um, and then Shakam definitely brought it around to, to more wholly understand the concept of cosmopolitanism as you're a citizen of the cosmos, not a particular place. Um, so you would necessarily treat others as a citizen equally as as, as you are. So, um, yeah, just a short summary. Um, Abdul, sorry, we lost you there. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm having a bad connection here. But I, I think from what I understood really uh, is that um, the relationship between Stoics and or stoicism, cosmopolitanism, is that um, the the um, virtue of justice. I don't think that the aim is to diversify the community more than if the community happened to be diversified uh, or diverse, then it should be treated in, in justice. Or um, I think that's, well, from my very basic observation uh, that that's what I concluded or that's what I found from my very brief research um, yeah that was it oh yeah Tony yeah I think it's just a, a, a just judging things at a surface level I think helping out in the community is one of those few um, endeavors that you can undertake which has mutual benefits for, for everybody um, not only for the individual being helped but also for yourself just in self edification you know it's a good experience to, to help other people and to cause good in a situation where otherwise it might not have existed um, now how does that principle of sort of commutative benefit relates back to stoicism? Um, I, and again, I don't know for sure, but from my reading, I, I noticed that a lot of times when they talk about cosmopolitanism, they contrast stoicism with cynicism and epicureanism, and for good reasons. Um, so I think to understand, like, because they're all Hellenistic philosophies, maybe it's good to understand why Stoicism is unique in this respect, because Epicureans did not like the idea of serving public life. They did not like the idea of um, helping your community. They thought the best way to live was to avoid pain, which meant to avoid public life and public scrutiny. So to kind of recede into this bubble of yours, um, they, that's very anti-Stoic. Um, cynics, cynics and, and Stoics were very, very similar when Zeno started the school, but from what I was reading, the Cynics were a bit more um, individualistic and anarchic uh, in the way in which they lived. Um, so they both, I, I, they both agreed with the idea of, of treating other people as equal, equally as citizens of the cosmos, but they, um, uh, the, the Cynics never necessarily advocated for public um, service. Um, I think the cosmopolitanism grew in, into this idea of public service um, by, by by the likes of Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Actually, I think that's that's where they it, it grew to its height. Um, 
because I don't think Epictetus even necessarily um, meant to use Stoicism as a way to provide for your community, or is it like a justification for why you should be helping your community? I think it was Marcus Aurelius and Seneca who saw the real benefits of doing it. Um, there's actually lesser known Stoics, um, uh, like um, Credo, and I have to say Credo of this, but I forget the Credo, which Credo this was, but there was a um, Stoic Credo, for example, who was a politician, and the story goes that like other Stoics and philosophers, I think he um, was forced to kill himself. Um, happened all the time, I guess, around then. Um, uh, and um, uh, there's a story of, of him and one other Stoic philosopher who uh, got up in the middle of a um, uh, um, political meeting, whether it was a senatorial or otherwise, and they um, he, he, he refused to basically vote or agree with the consensus. Um, uh, um, and it's this sense of moral responsibility to public service that I think came not from the early Stoics, but came from where the later Stoics, and especially the Stoics that are in public service. I think that's actually quite unique. Like the Cynics and Epicureans never had that. The Stoics were the ones who had to have like a, actually a lot of their philosophers as politicians. So I think the reason for at least, I know this doesn't exactly answer your question as to the benefit of society, but the reason for the Stoics having this idea of public service for the common good, it comes from the politicians of their, their age. Um, I can't tell you. That's an interesting question, though, to explore. Um, uh, what benefit would it serve? Like, why, why to what end would you um, kind of give yourself to public service or community service? Um, I'll, I'll end with this, maybe, maybe just as an opinion of mine. Um, uh, for one thing, I guess I think this is connected. I do agree with Abdul that the whole purpose wasn't diversity. I think it's maybe simply a byproduct um, of accepting other people from, from other parts of the world. Um, and I think the whole point of um, cosmopolitanism um, actually implies community service at least if you if you think of it in a certain way like for me like if if um if i have if i want to treat other people outside of the citizen of this of the city or outside of my family or friend group um that means i would necessarily have to help them in the same ways that i help my family and friends but that's all i can think of in terms of benefit i i think like diversity was more of a byproduct. Like this would naturally help society rather than we should be making society better in this way. I don't think they necessarily thought like that. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think they necessarily thought like that. That was my spiel. That was all I, that was pretty much a lot from what I got from my research. Um, you can get this from, um, Actually, a good, um, a, I'll tell you a couple of sources actually to get this from. Um, uh, one of those sources is John Seller's article, is still in the event description. And another source I got from Meditations, it's exactly uh, uh, some, some ideas I got from the Meditations. And depending on the, tr like the, um, I think the free version online. Is, is okay, but I, I bought a um, I bought a very nice hard copy of the Meditations, and there's this nice like 40 page long introduction on the Meditations, and it basically includes um, everything you want to know about Marcus Aurelius and Stoicism. Uh, maybe I, I'll, I'll put this I'll put this in the in the chat like the um, uh, the publisher and the publishing year. So if anybody wants to track this copy down. Yeah, so it's a it's a 2006 copy from from Penguin Penguin Random House.
ครับถูก Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to ask. I know the um, Marcus Aurelius meditations are translated, but I just wanted to know: is there like um, a particular translation that is um, most accurate according to the original, uh, comparing to the original scripts? For me, I don't know. I would have no idea. I've this is the this is the only copy I've read. Um, I haven't I didn't read any of the online free copies yet, which I should actually. I should read before the next couple of meetings. I'll probably compare some of the quotes and some of the famous quotes and some of the famous lines from Marcus Aurelius in this copy with that of the copy in on the um, the uh, the wiki that I posted in the event description for next week. Because um, I think in the wiki there's like four different translations. I think there's several of them actually. There's four or five of them, and they range from the translation years to range from like in 16, like 16 something to like early 1900s. So they range quite a bit. Actually, comparing like the the earliest and the latest would be quite interesting. I don't know. All I know is that um, based upon my 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 rough readings of this, they translators and academics constantly fight over what's the better translation. Um, right. Like this word, actually, I'll give you an example which directly relates to um, uh, uh, relates to actually our topic. So this this idea of oik, and I'm going to butcher this word, um, oikosis. Um, it's spelled uh, like this. Um, this is a Greek word I couldn't find a translation for. Um, it's a Greek word used by the Stoics and and Stoic um, friendlies who wanted to convey the idea of um, in, as the, what I, the best translation I actually found wasn't really a translation. It was, it was, it's antonym, it's opposite. It's, um, and okay, this word oikosis seemed to be an antonym to alienation. And oikosis, this, this, this rough principle seems to be the building block for why the Stoics thought that it's just to, um, to reach out to your community and to consider others and yourself as part of a citizen of the cosmos, not a particular city or, or state. Um, the, there are some translations that might work well, like for example, they use appropriation or alliance, but they're not really good. You know, like they, these, these English words are not, I don't think really fit the idea well. So I think this is an example where I've, I've read a few other articles on it. I didn't post in the event description. Nobody has a good translation of it. Some people translate it as home when they want to put it in context. Uh, it's, I don't know. It's, it, but the, um, I think just understanding it in terms of opposite to alienation might, might be a better way of thinking about this interview work we were. So, but I have no idea about the better best translation for meditations. All I can say is that they probably are fighting over them, just like this word. Right. Yeah. Because I'm considering reading the meditation, so just said it was worth asking before. But yeah, maybe I just have to read and compare um, to to have the best understanding of the meditations. I guess. I'm actually they curious. Be that different, should they? Well, actually, I wanted to ask Shakam, what's yeah. that? What's that f uh, first quote by in the meditations you you wrote down from? Which translation? It's in 1909 or something. Uh, translation. Okay. You see the archaic uh, language. It's all the uh, thou and thee and. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. A, it's a bit harder uh, to read, but it gives a certain style. Uh, it. Um, I think an, another translation would be better to start with. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's. Um, I, I wish a lot of the translations. The same thing with Seneca and Epictetus. They always have these ancient, ancient translations, like from early 1900, 1800s, for free. Great. It's, it's great. They're for, for they're for free. But it's unfortunate that we don't have a newer free translation because. 
sometimes the language you write is really archaic. Um, um, yeah, that's a good a, a quote, by the way, Tony. Um, uh, that's what I, I've also read that they partly got this idea of uh, cosmopolitanism from Socrates. Actually, John Sellers quotes the same quote about Socrates. Um, uh, I am a citizen of the world, not I'm an Athenian or I'm from Corinth. Um, so I think this principle goes back way before the Stoics. This is more of a Greek principle generally. Um, I think actually, I, I don't know if this directly connects, but I think um, the reason why Socrates was asked to kill himself not, was not just because he was corrupt in the youth, it was because the Athenians thought he was a, he was a Spartan sympathizer. Um, so I, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but maybe his philosophy of treating Spartans and others as equals has something to do with his, his death. Um, uh, because it would, it would seem to fit that he's kind of trying to bring everybody else into this universe or cosmos and, and equal citizens thereof. Just a passing thought, but that's a really good quote. That's that quote I've seen before. Uh, Tony. Yeah, I just, I'm just thinking, I'm just wondering about the ethics of cosmopolitanism and the notion of, of helping other people and the benefits of it. If you take benefit directly from that and that's your only motivation, is it an actual ethical thing to do? Um, the only reason I ask that is because one of my good friends um, does a lot in the community, um, but likes to make it very well known that he does um, on social media and all this type of stuff. It's never sort of done in private. And I, I think the benefit is for him rather than the actual community as a whole. So is there any sort of ethical standpoint from doing an act of good seemingly but really it's only for your own benefit. Um, because I think that's quite an interesting aspect of that, really. I uh, should come. Um, yeah, that's a broader ethics uh, question. Uh, but uh, first, um, yeah, I, I get to what uh, they got uh, Socrates to, uh, to kill himself, seeing... Um, People as humans uh, is an awful thing to do. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so I think doing good in the community for whatever reason, even if it's the most selfish reason uh, uh, you can think of, it's still good. I mean, helping uh, people. Uh, I don't think it's a uh, pure um, and how say uh, and um, how say like there is uh, this um, Christian uh, thought about oh if uh, I'll be good uh, in this life uh, I'll get a uh, uh, I'll get to heaven uh, for a, I'll say, blissful existence, uh, blissful and uh, eternal existence. And if you do good um, and help other people only for this blissful existence, then I don't think you're a good person. <laughs> it's you're still a selfish person um, and doing stuff for your own benefit. Then again, I don't think it's possible to be purely good and do things without any self selfish uh, reasoning. You'll have no reason to do so. So I think my ethics are not as dogmatic and not as, um, how to say, um, Absolute. So, if uh, if your friend does uh, good in the community, and he feels that uh, he needs to get the recognition, then why not? 
I mean, if he's uh, not actually doing any good, but just uh, faking it, then yeah, he's an evil person. But I don't know. I don't know the situation. Um, right. I wanted uh, to say something about uh, how uh, the Greek word uh, oiko became echo in medieval uh, Latin, and that's where we get the uh, ecology ecological uh, system and, and, and such, but Steve, yeah, go, go ahead. Oh, really? You mean, you mean the beginning of this word here that I put in? Wow. Okay. That's quite interesting. So there, okay. I, I'll come back to that. I actually wanted to actually, I think it was only the second time, Tony, when you, when you asked that question about the benefit, I really understood what you were asking. Because, I mean, I th think a Stoic would actually say some, something similar to Shakam, that it's, but in this way, I think they would say, like, the ideal sage is good enough that they don't think about themselves. They think only for the good of others and for the sake of others to do community service. But I think in reality, they would say that doesn't really ever happen. Uh, the point is to, like, it's a, it's a weird there, it's almost like Stoicism cornered itself, um, because if the whole point is for you to master your virtues, then you're never going to be doing community service for others. You're always going to be doing it so you can master your own virtues yourself. So there is a sense of self-interest in doing community service. There's never, you're never going to be completely, I, I would agree with Shikam on this, that I think even the Stoics would agree that you're never going to be sage-like. You're always going to have to you're always going to be doing some community service for the benefit of yourself rather than thinking only in terms of the benefit for the others. Um, I think the, um, uh, it's almost like the, the, um, the stoic principle that you, you try to, um, master your virtues. You try to live virtuously and this, this idea of, um, uh, Ataraxia, tranquility or, or happiness um, is kind of like just a byproduct of being virtuous, I think is the same thing with community service, where you're trying to um, uh, do service for your community, trying to be virtuous, so you're more or less doing it for yourself. And it's just a byproduct that you be happy for others and doing things for others. Um, I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think, I think there's no way out of it. I, I would agree that there's no... Um, uh, I mean, un unless, unless you so, um, in your kind of essence or, or soul, let's say, I'm, I'm not sure how else to explain it, but in your kind of your own mind, you so ingrain in yourself, the assumption that doing good for others is just good. But again, that's like being a sage and nobody's really a sage. So the point is to try and be like that, but I don't think you ever, you ever completely, relinquish your yourself uh, out of the equation. That's a really good, and I just wanted to mention again, that's a really good, interesting, interesting connection to um, the word eco, ecology, and the, how we get that from this word. Um, and maybe we come back to this when we talk about hierarchy circles, which is a really good, I think a good connection to make. Um, uh, Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, just thinking about uh, Tony's question, <laughs> it's quite a um, broad and complex one, complex one to answer, really. But um, I do agree it's an ethical question. And, yeah. Um, don't want, I don't want to go to <laughs> where the, the question, where what's the resource of the ethics? <laughs> because that's a different story that maybe for another day. But um, yeah, uh, I, I agree with Shukam and 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 also with um, Steve um, with what they said uh, regarding that point. Um, but for me, I think it's also it has to do with. Uh, I mean, some people. Uh, it has it has something to do with. Um, um, uh, religious values they get re rewarded if they do good so that motivates uh, some people for doing good um, not merely to get some 
um, particular interest for them for themselves, uh, uh, or they want physically something back from you, but it's just something uh, they feel um, is part of the obligation to do. But well, generally speaking, uh, I, I do think that um, it, it has also to do with, as far as I know, like when you do favor to people, they have the tendency to return it to you or even um, sh- spread this great um, uh, behavior around the community at which like it's um, spread all over and they they're all become cooperative and connected community. Uh, it strengthened the bonds between the members of community too. So um, this is like maybe a long-term uh, um, benefit that you gain by doing good without expecting anything in return. Um, also, I think it's also altruistic thing to do, which is something that I really um, enjoy, uh, honestly. And uh, yeah, I think uh, being altruistic is one of the ways of gaining uh, what's called maybe communal value. That when you being altruistic and you care about others more than you care about yourself, yourself is 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 one of the ways of gaining communal value. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I can expand on that, but I'll just. I'll just leave it there for now. I also saw, um, uh, um, just to continue expanding on the topic, um, I saw connections to this principle of oikosis, which I guess is a that, that fundamental principle behind cosmopolitanism um, that um, uh, the um, it keeps coming up over and over again that uh, kind of a measure of how somebody how cosmopolitan or how how well they're living the virtues and ascribing to this this principle of oikosis is um, not just how much of a good citizen and public service they're doing, um, but um, uh, that how well they're raising their children. Or how well they're connecting to their family. And I see this in more than once, in more than one article, and more than one um, uh, um, review of stoicism. Um, so, uh, but I th- think again that um, it still sounds like you're just doing it for yourself. You're just doing it for the sake of um, connecting with others, so that you feel more connected to the cosmos. I think that's the whole point. That's where cosmopolitanism brings this full circle, is that the whole point of connecting with others and do, doing community service is um, making sure you feel more at home in the cosmos. Um, there's a good there's a good line, um, I forget where I found it, um, that is not a quote. Uh, it's a quote from a secondary source that basically summarized this principle like this, that um, uh, the Stoics basically tried to say that you should feel um, uh, um, uh, nothing is foreign to you. As a Stoic, nothing should be foreign to you because the idea is that um, you feel at home anywhere, anytime. Um, and that's basically where they want to, what they want to ultimately achieve is to be a citizen of the cosmos, to feel like they're, nothing is foreign and nowhere is foreign to them. Um, I think we can, um, yeah, Tony. Yeah, I've, I've been reading some um, Ryan Holiday stuff. Um, he's a massive proponent of helping out the local community. And just talking about bringing up children as well, the, I think he's doing a great job of that. He does the Daily Dad um, podcast and to get a daily email, just hints and tips on how to relate to your kids and things of that nature. I think that's a massive aspect of cosmopolitanism um it's not just doing well in the wider community but really it just it does start at home um and you have to lead by example um i think that's a major aspect of it really and then you bring up the next generation 
of, of people who have a positive effect. Yeah. yeah, that's a really good point. It's also really helpful to like, as because traditionally, like this month of service, we can easily find ways to go out as a group and really connect to the outer community. But right now we can't. I mean, in a lot of places in the world, it's difficult to kind of um, to, to, to go out as normal because most places are closed. I found even, uh, even when the pandemic began uh, and it was the fall of last year, um, Teresa used to come here more often to these, to these meetups. Uh, she, she helped us basically uh, search for um, uh, community outreach programs or community service programs we can all get connected to. There's just not many of them open right now because of coronavirus. So it's, it's actually good to always remind ourselves like, like especially Tony, you make a really good example further that it's um, starting with the family or doing things at home or doing things one-on-one -on -one with somebody you love or care for is probably a really good start if you can't do anything else to, to start on your path to be, more, um, uh, to be more connected to others, to feel less foreign in the company of others. Uh, Shakam. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe you want to, to first uh, talk about uh, the circles uh, and such. Um, you can talk about it now if you want. That was going to be my next kind of lead-in, but you can talk about it now if you, if you, will, if you want to connect it. Yeah. So um, my, my personal ethics um, are more practical and pragmatic and I would ask what's the individual uh, uh, benefits uh, from altruism. Um, but I think the Stoics um, first had a, the, the metaphysics, the metaphysical idea of the universe, of the cosmos, and how um, yeah, the, the quote uh, I posted, um, constantly regard the universe as one living being, having one sub substance and one soul, and observe how all things have reference uh, to one perception, the perception of this one living being. So if everything uh, is just a, a part that's resonating with this whole this this cosmos then we should regard everyone as a part uh, of this uh, um, one living being so so yeah uh, but this is like going first from the from the biggest uh, circle imaginable uh, down which I think is um like the opposite of how people usually would think about it you know first the personal then the the family the local community and and so on and so forth um but yeah how do you see it what what do you think i'm just sharing my screen because maybe it's good to have hierarchically circles up here so hierarchies it's actually something, is a Stoic philosopher I only found out in the last few weeks about. I didn't really know much about him because he's really, when you talk about Hierocles and Stoicism, you only talk about him in this context. Like when you, when you, um, this is a little bit of a, it's a small picture so that the words may be blurry, but I hope you can, there's just a few words on here, just the labels. Um, and Hierocles circles is basically an exercise. It's actually not necessarily a concept. It's a way for them, it's a way for the Stoics to meditate um, or reflect on their connection to other people and underneath this one cosmos or whole. Um, and yet, usually, usually they do meditate in the in the upward direction. So they start with the um, the self, the mind and the body, your own personal self, um, and then they start meditating on others and how connected, how basically how really indifferent or um, 
similar you are to others in, in many respects. You start connecting yourself to the family, then you connect and yourself and to the fellow citizens, and then you and then you kind of breach that wall of citizenship. You start thinking about they the 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 original. This, these are the original. Um, concepts. So countrymen could be more like, um, I guess you could replace fellow citizens with local community. Your countrymen could be people of national uh, national similarity to you. And then mankind as a whole is, is the global community. So you start kind of out thinking bigger, 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 how less foreign these other people in the world are to you. Um, and the, the whole idea of the circle, I think, is not just the fact that you see the self included in the family. It's the idea that all of them are included in this one circle. So like the biggest circle around everything is actually the cosmos. It's everybody underneath one cosmos or one um, state of nature, um, so to speak. Um, but it, it is interesting, Shakam, that you, you go the other way because I, I wonder if that also has benefits when you meditate on that because um, that might help you to um, going back and forth, actually, because going upward makes sense. I guess just if you're just beginning to understand this concept, but going downward would make sense to really grasp the concept that all are really part of this cosmos. Um, but these are hierarchy circles, and they're basically a tool for you to use um, to, to meditate on this fact and to... It could also be a useful tool as you do service. So um, I also like the idea that it doesn't it doesn't exclude the self. You know, it doesn't just start with friends and family. Because a, a really good po point to this to these circles is that you should always take care of yourself first and foremost. That's that's where the Stoics start. You should never not care for yourself. Um, but a really good tool I would use is start thinking exactly how Tony was thinking, is that um, start thinking small, start thinking about how you can care about yourself and do service to yourself, then start thinking about how you can help your family and then do help your family and then continue going up from there. So I think, I think this is quite like, Pioneering. I don't. Oh, I, I sorry. I just saw your hands. Um, but I was. I was just saying. I think this is quite. Um, a better word for it is ahead of their time, um, because you don't really see this concept come up too much until maybe the the Enlightenment and this broader idea of humanism starts to come up. Um, so I think it actually this was like several centuries behind its um, behind its time when it could have thrived more. Uh, I didn't see whose hand was up first, uh, so maybe we go to Abdul and then Shakam because I think we just heard Shakam. Um, Abdul. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, I'm just thinking back um, about you know helping others or strangers or foreigners as you, as if you're you're helping. Um, uh, member of your family or something that who you that that you care about maybe maybe it's not practical or it's not always possible because you know if you maybe you don't have the energy to do that right especially if you often being asked for help maybe you don't have the energy to help others um, stranger or foreigner as much as you uh, uh, helping uh, someone that you care about, for example, family member. Um, maybe practically it's not possible, but maybe a better analogy to go by is treating others as you wish to be treated. Like if you're asking help from stranger, how you expect these a stranger to react to your request and act accordingly. But uh, at the end of the day is help at least not refusing to help is is something better than nothing really but you know sometimes you may fall in the situation where you cannot help at all which is also possible or maybe uh, you when you realize or you know that your help will do more harm than good especially if you're ignorant about <laughs> what they're asking you to do 
saying, I don't know how to help you, sorry, is better than helping them and maybe putting them in worse situation there. But um, yeah, just a thought came by, I wish to say. No, it's a good thought. Um, uh, but you're right. I mean, there are times when you shouldn't help others. I think you see those signals sometimes when you realize people, somebody may not want help. Um, or there there are times when you should help and they don't want you to help. In, the, in extreme cases, like um, if you have a, a friend who needs an intervention or something, that, that's kind of an example where you kind of should push the, the help. But then there might be other cases where um, you need to let somebody be because they want to help themselves more than they want help from other people in certain cases. Um, yeah, I think it's just based on context. I would say that a stoic would say, just determine if it's, um, uh, if it's in, in, in your control to persuade them to help, to help them or, or out of your control and then, and then go from there. Um, Shakam. Uh, yeah, I want to say that, um, I think uh, in my in my head, um, the, I, I skipped a couple of uh, circles because I don't see like fellow citizens, countrymen, and mankind as fundamentally different. Um, so for me, it's like myself, my family, and then you know, whole ma mankind. Um, but I think it, it could be useful uh, if you want to escape uh, um, patterns of uh, nationalism and racism. Uh, going through these circles uh, might be um, a, a helpful, um, helpful way to uh, um, to be set free from these uh, patterns of uh, thought. Um, so the main reason why I, I went, um, from the universe, um, inward is that, uh, this connection between, um, uh, Oiko and Echo and this, uh, this idea that, you know, inter, uh, let's say all the being connected to other living beings uh, does it have to stop uh, with uh, mankind um, where if we say um, we need to, to help uh, others uh, do we include only humans uh, what about other living beings uh, in the universe? Are they, are they like, uh, are they included in one of these circles? And I can't really find places where um, the Stoics uh, talk about, um, yeah, being kind to to animals. Usually it's like, uh, yeah, be kind uh, to uh, your fellow citizens, to slaves, to women, and your pets, but like, and it's only like one, one line. What do you think? Yeah, Tony. I think that might just relate generally to being a compassionate person. It's compassion. Um, I don't think you need to specify the sort of nature of the living being, or, um, whether they're an animal or human, and whether you generally are compassionate and you act with compassion when it's required. I think may be the answer. Yeah, Abdul. Yeah, thanks. 
actually agree with um, Tony uh, here. Um, being compassionate is a good um, quality, generally speaking. <laughs> and I do agree with uh, Shokam about the uh, um, three circles <laughs> analogy instead of <laughs> more detailed one. Uh, it'll be myself, family or friend family slash friend will be someone else so i don't have these yeah. um <laughs> yeah <laughs> different um yeah <laughs> i don't think that'll treat countrymen different from uh someone else um but yeah um it's yeah being compassionate and uh supportive to others generally Yeah, I think the um, it's funny you guys all think this three the top three circles should be condensed into one. Um, I think it's uh, it's it's good to to, to make a, maybe change some of the words. Countrymen seems old fashioned to say, but um, uh, um, uh, but I think this is those three circles are less useful for us um, because we do feel a bit more cosmopolitan than perhaps the average person. Um, especially any of us who might have lived in a big city or, or are coming to these online meetings and seeing people from all around the world. Um, uh, but um, I think this is also really useful for these times in, in rising nationalism in, in some countries around the world where some people really don't understand that that you are really no no not really different from other people outside of your national boundaries. Um, I maybe one of you have have has, has started uh, listening to the the podcast, um, uh, the Stoic Psychologist, because or, or Stoic Psychology. I forget which one is the name of the blog and which one is the name of the podcast. But um, he has an episode where he mentions hierarchy circles, and he um, he does interview um, a um, Stoic uh, speaker who is also. Uh, an academic in environmentalism, and uh, they, it, you are right that, that basically the Stoics do not mention anything about the environment. I think that's perhaps because they didn't have the impending, basically impending doom of of and like natural catastrophe and mass migration that we have today because of the rapid environmental change. Um, uh, but I think. I also think it's be also because they live closer to nature. I mean, they literally live right next to it. They didn't have massive industry like we did today. So I think back then they saw no distinction between where they lived and nature. Whereas today we have to plant trees artificially just so we can be closer to nature. Because in a big city, you're not really a part of nature. Um, so I think it's I think it's completely different today, especially because of industry. Um, I would say. <laughs> So for me, the, the easy answer, and I'm going to switch my screen off because I think we we, we understand these circles well enough. Um, for me, the, I've been vegan for over eight years now. And for me, the, the principle of um, uh, treating animals like this comes very naturally, um, which actually I think is a problem because I think if so, for me personally, what works is that I, I need to expand these circles to include the environment, to include other creatures, other beings, and so forth. Um, but I think that only works for me and maybe other Stoic vegans. I think there's a problem that if Stoicism, uh, and I, I mentioned this because I don't want to exclude anybody, is because I think the problem comes when I force Stoicism to accept these extra circles. Um, I think the environment should be accepted, but I don't think the the environment needs to include necessarily other animals, unless you feel passionately about it. Because by um, including other non-human animals, um, I'm basically excluding everybody who eats meat or dairy from stoicism. And that's a huge, huge, huge problem, especially in the context of cosmopolitanism. This is basically running through my head right now as we speak. And so I, I'm, I'm realizing that I think I think in order to be cosmopolitan, um, uh, I think I think stoicism maybe 
I wouldn't say officially, but in terms of a modern stoic ethic, I think these circles can definitely include the natural environment around us. But I think I think other beings, other other creatures, not human creatures, I think depends on depends on who you are. Uh, I have a strong ethic about it, but in order for the philosophy itself to be inclusive, I don't think it's necessarily the case that other non-human creatures are included just for the just for the sake of um, not making others feel excluded. Um, I think that also runs counter to cosmopolitanism. I think you need to start accepting. I think there's also a sense of being voluntary about it. Like if, if um, uh, there's greater motivation in voluntarily accepting some of these virtues and ethics than there is being forced into it. Um, I would never evangelize some of these things, but it is a really good question. I mean, well, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but um, would there be any extra circles to add to this? Doesn't have to be the environment or, or, or like circles, but are there, are there any extra circles you don't feel are included in this um, that just because of the time they lived in might have been excluded for reasons they just didn't think of. Yeah, I think uh, I think the self, family, friends, a uh, humankind, and then like uh, animals. Um, instead of like the countrymen and um, what was it, uh, citizens, uh, I, w I would put uh, animals and then uh, plants, and then the universe. Mm -hmm. um, because I think uh, I see more similarities uh, between myself uh, and uh, let's say a mammal, a or like a dog or, or whatever, uh, and uh, to a tree. Uh, but I still value and see more similarities between me, myself and, and a tree than myself to a rock. So I see the circle of um, uh, the broader universe as farther away, but still, like all, all these things are a uh, part of the, the harmony of the universe, so I think we should uh, respect them. I still eat some of them, but um, that mean I don't respect them. Yeah, I definitely agree with the, the countrymen and the fellow citizens. I also agree that why friends are not even included. It's interesting that they didn't include, they included family, but not friends. And I'm wondering if this has something to do with the fact that um, uh, the Stoics didn't think it necessary to have friends. They, um, but they, they thought that, um, they thought that you should take care of yourself. Like the last time you should become self-sufficient before you move on to think to, to, to acquiring friends. I think because I think they excluded friends because I think they didn't um, make it necessary to have friends. I think today though, you, the psych, every psychological research you can find says that having a close knit group of friends or uh, friends, you, people you can rely on outside of your family is basically does every kind of support and benefit to your, to your well-being and your, in your kind of self, a sense of self, um, self-worth. Um, I also, I also, I also agree. You can, you can absolutely be, um, be included in this and not, um, and, and still eat, eat, eat your meat. Uh, there's actually, whenever, whenever I think of, um, uh, um, uh, a good non-vegan argument for that, um, I think of, uh, anybody living north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, and they have to constantly be on the lookout for survival. They have no, they, have, they really have no plants to, to eat off of. They have to eat off of the, the fat and meat to keep themselves warm of, of whether it's seals or moose or something else that lives that far north. And um, for me, that always, that always, always comes to mind when I think of um, 
people have to, there's a compassionate way to do that too. And a lot of times I see, um, or, um, uh, this documentary I saw a while ago where people living that North um, kind of pay honor to the, the, the animals they kill, or they understand that this is necessary for survival. This is not industry in the making. Um, Abdul. Um, yeah, I just uh, want to reiterate uh, the point uh, Shokam is talking about, which is, um, yeah, it will be myself, then friends slash family, then it will be someone else. After that, it will be the rest of the universe or everything else. <laughs> um, but yeah, of course, it's important to um, care about the environment, also to care about um, animals, even the one that you will be uh, or people consume as food. They still need to be treated fairly uh, and uh, with dignity, of course. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, so the, see, I don't know if you, I can call it uh, an argument, but the way I ordered it uh, in, in my head is, so one of the most basic stoic uh, principles is to live uh, according to nature. But how can you know what's uh, according you know, to nature, to logos, to the universe, I don't know whatever um, you want to say. So uh, the cosmopolitanism is your, your way to connect with other people, with other living beings as a lifeline to, to the universe. So if uh, other beings are, you know, a part of the divine or the universe or, or nature, then if you connect with them, then you get a bit closer, a bit more in tune with the cosmos. And, and I think that's the basic, uh, the basic wish or the what the Stoics uh, wanted uh, in life. And uh, I mean, you can connect it uh, with um, uh, the Buddhist uh, en enlightenment and trying to reach Nirvana and uh, be a, a part of uh, the, the universal one. I don't see it uh, exactly like that, but just um, getting closer to a fundamental um, um, feeling, I don't, I don't know how to how to call it, but that's that's I think the metaphysical why why connect with other people. Yeah, I think I think in practice maybe it's better if you work downward. Um, by thinking of the universe as a whole, than how everybody is grouped underneath it. But I think the meta, I think you're right. I think the upward in the circles is actually the metaphysical reason for why you do this is because to ultimately connect yourself to the cosmos uh, and to other, to other, to other human beings and, and the, the environment. Um, I wanted to, um, because uh, I also, um, I only learned this today, but I actually have to leave at 5.30. Um, so I, I can't stay for the entire two hours. Um, but in, in regardless, I think this is around the time, and I'll, uh, Abdul, I'll give you a chance to speak in a second, but I think this is around the time where maybe we wanna turn our conversation from the theory into practice and to understand um, what are the uh, small or grand ways we could, I think we could, we should focus on small ways. Like as Tony was mentioning about, about um, um, learning how to treat your son and, and parent him, that um, what are the small ways we can continue actually practicing this cosmopolitanism and kind of outreaching to, to other human beings to be a part of the, part of the cosmos? Um, Abdul. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I just want to uh, expand on the circles. Uh, it's just uh, just to say um, the way I'm looking at it is not the order of priority, if you see what I, what I mean. Sometimes there are problems with the universe that we need to deal with that are quite critical um, to our existence. Um, but other times, oh, it's there's a problem with myself that I need to treat. Um, other times, it's something wrong with a member of your family. So it's not necessarily the order. Maybe it can be the order of uh, priority sometimes. But, I mean, generally speaking, I, I'm not looking at it, it as an or, like order of priority, but rather the logical... <laughs> um, um, the logical, how can I say, difference, like, or maybe categories. Um, but yeah, in terms of priorities, you may run into problem that needs, with the universe, that needs more attention than everything else happening in your life right now. So um, in terms of tackling problems, your priorities can be customized. They, what, the way I see it, they don't have to be in the same, maybe, apparent order of the circles. Yeah, and the, the, just before I segue into Tony, but I think this is the good segue into practice, is that don't just, I, for me, I, I wouldn't just consider the circles as, in, like, as sets. One thing includes another. I would also think of it as if you're doing service to your family, you're also doing service to the universe. That's the way you should see it. Every time you do service to one part of humanity, you're doing service to all of humanity. I think that's maybe maybe also a good way to think about to, to think about this because you're right. You, there's never really what kind of justice can you do to the entire universe. Um, uh, so I think, um, or to all of humanity, I don't think politicians can even do that to an extent. I think they have to focus on little priorities and, and tasks. Um, uh, Tony. Yeah, just talking about practical ways. Um, one thing that we will do, um, starting tomorrow actually, is um, litter picking um, just in the local forest. Just me, my wife and my son. Um, nobody else there. We never see another human being in there. Very, very rarely, which is quite nice. Um, but you know, just making a difference in whatever way you can. But I think what's important for me, on a personal level, is that it, the acts that you make, the positive acts that you make in the community, should be without any form of self-interest or evangelism. You know, you don't want to do it just for the sake of someone saying, "Oh, you're doing a good thing." Um, I think just for me personally, it's it's best just done in private and um, and with a, an element of instruction for me, for, for my son, really. Um, but I think whatever difference you can make straight outside your front door um, is always a good thing, yeah. It's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, uh, you should definitely be teaching yourselves that um, and if you, like you said, teach your son that um, you're not doing, basically you're not doing service to others for the rewards, for the, or, or like for the applause. You're doing it because it's a good thing to do. Um, I think that's also really important that uh, maybe that's something politicians get carried away with. You know, they start, they start, they start, oftentimes they might start their career by thinking they're doing good because they're doing good, but then they get so used to the public um, response that they start doing things because of the public response. And I think while to an extent that's important, otherwise democracies don't work, to an extent they also have to do good because they should be doing good. Um, I think that that's something we forget because um, also, it's actually really interesting because I've never brought up a, a, a kid before, but I know just from teaching students that um, that you can easily get trapped into that that method of um, 
giving a, a little reward if, if you want them to do something, ask, ask them to um, uh, um, do something for the sake of that reward. Or if you have trouble handling a student, I, you know, you, you, a teacher might um, tell them, well, if you, know, did, if you do this, you can do this as well. You know, if you, if you do X tasks, you can do, you can have Y minutes on your, on your computer, um, something like that, where you, you, you give them a little bit of a reward. And um, I think it's easy to get trapped in that because then they're basically raised with the virtue that you should only do things because you get rewards for it, not because they're you're doing good or you're doing service to others. It's a really good point to remember. I really like that idea though. It's just stepping, just like immediately stepping outside and seeing, looking around you and seeing to yourself, what can I do here and now and right around me in my, in my locality? Um, Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share um, a point that I've had in uh, um, a webinar that that was provided by a social counselor or slash life coach. He was talking about um, if you look into all creatures, you'll realize that um, humans, as far as I know, are the only creatures or the only mammals that require support from the moment of their birth. If you see, for example, horses, when they're born, the baby horse could stand on their foot like after hours from their birth. But this is not the case with humans. They need constant support from the moment of their birth. So, and that, that, kind of support changes over time so it'll start by the basic needs the need for to be fed uh, to be secure and to be in good hand and good environment but it'll grow um, at middle age or teenage and start being emotional support they don't need the basic support because presumably they'll be able to sustain themselves and be independent but then when they grow, maybe having a family, child to look after, so they look after their child, but then when they grow and become very old, grandparents, now the good um, amount of attention and care that you provide to your kids will be provided to you as elder because at some point <laughs> you will not be able to help yourself. When, you, when it comes to very old age. So, and the world of, the world starts becoming more towards being uh, inv individualistic and uh, independent, but we are still dependent on the people around us. It's, let's not forget that we are social creatures after all. And regardless how powerful we are, we still need the people around us. Maybe not, toxic dependency, like you cannot survive without them, but rather the positive uh, dependency that we need. Um, we need to be aware of that, aware of this picture all the time. I think it, it's important. Sometimes we, we don't realize these basic things, but when they said it, I said, like, wow, yeah, you're right. Like, you see in the documentaries, horse the baby horse could start hours from the birth. It's really spectacular, but then it's not the case with humans. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um... I think with, um, with a small caveat, um, humans do need the uh, support, um, and it's always good uh, to have support. Um, but I think, um, okay, in in my mind. Um, uh, I'll change um, 
the the just the terms to uh, connections um and yeah it, it reminds me of um you know the uh, south um, african uh, tribes uh, in the botswana and such uh, the, even uh, adults uh, sleep uh, together cuddled um and it's the most natural thing for them um and if you look at uh, other uh, 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 great apes uh, the communal living is 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 a very central part of their existence the fact that uh, we drifted uh, away from a uh, communal uh, living and sleeping uh, i think it does ha- as a harm uh, emotionally uh, i don't think i would like to to sleep uh, with a group of uh, people <laughs> but uh, I, i can i can see how uh, how the way you feel about uh, your place in the universe um, might change if you have this um, these kind of connections uh, with uh, your human and natural environment and just uh, shortly about um, the daily a uh, cosmopolitan life Yes, I think it's impossible, as a uh, as you said, to to do a uh, good for the whole universe. Um, I don't think any person should aspire to have so much power. <laughs> um, but to to recognize the power we have on the. Uh, our families on uh, our immediate surroundings uh, it's a very empowering realization and because this is our cosmos we don't have any any other that's that's our our reach so yeah so it's it's great yeah. um yeah I, i wanted to mention um A couple of things um but the um uh, the first thing i wanted to mention quickly was just um a kind of a um force of habit i've tr- been trying to get into um my girlfriend is really good at doing this i don't know where she got it from maybe she's just been doing this for a long time but um uh without fail every and this is this just thinking of the little things we can do uh, in terms of practicing Her service to others is every time she sees somebody ask her for money she gives it every time without fail and the only time she doesn't is when she doesn't have change on her in fact she keeps a change short at home just so she can take, take a little bit of change every day to make sure she has some in her pocket um something i'm trying to get used to too i don't have the change chart yet at home but i have the change in my pocket that i'm always willing to give so um Uh, just something small that I'm trying to get in the habit of doing every time. I notice also that if you if you give them the time, they start talking to you. Um, uh, I noticed this. Um, I haven't had a long exchange with anybody like that, but I noticed the other day somebody had given somebody else money, was waiting by a train station, and um, they just started having a conversation. The guy who was asking for money actually stopped asking for money from some other people and just started chatting this guy up, um, which uh, maybe to an extent, I don't want to, too long of a conversation uh, uh, with but I think is a really um, I would really like if if they had the time for that they're the one asking for money so they need the help but um, uh, just um, getting to know them on a personal level um, I think also helps be more comfortable with the idea of giving them money just so you understand that they're real human beings to genuinely need help um for the life of me I, i can't remember it um uh shikam you mentioned um uh, uh about my thing about not doing not being able to do service for the entire universe um 
And then you mentioned something from the very beginning. I forget the first thing you mentioned. Um, it'll come back to me. Um, Abdul, you raised your hand. Yeah, just quick point. I, I agree with Shakam about the um, term, maybe. And, um, it was, honestly, it was like a direct translation. So maybe <laughs> I didn't use the right term. But yeah, I, I think it's more accurate to say connection than support. I agree with you. And definitely reiterating the point about private space, because many po many people have mixing this these points, like physically and emotionally, you need to have your own private space. I agree. I am thinking of practical things to do now. <laughs> so, yeah. That's that's actually what. So, so that that was it. That was I wanted to. I, I thought that was quite interesting that uh, you, you guys brought that up because I've also I've, I've often contemplated before moving. I mean, the last week I was I've actually been moving into my new place. That's why you see nothing in here because I've been. This is my old place. I'm um, I'm still renting for the month, but I I, I basically just moved to Quicksburg. And it was, it's my own place. For most of my life, I've lived with other people. I lived with um, my family, or after that, I lived with um, friends in, in college when I went to university. When I um, started living on my own, I didn't really live on my own. I lived with other people in VAs or in you know communal living spaces. Um, they actually have these um, uh, um, community-owned houses. Um, where before um, before moving in, everybody pretty much um, owns the house. Everybody living there owns the house. They own the land, and they basically buy the um, uh, they operate it as a as their own house for Vato, a house management. And they do it. They there are actually some here in, in Germany. Um, and so people do live like that, where people um, actively try to own their own living space. I think they have their own private rooms, of course, or be own bedrooms, but they basically try and live like a, um, a self-sufficient house community, almost. Um, I, I've, I've contemplated living there, but um, uh, I think having friend, have, having family and friends over, I would always like my own, my own living space. It's not out of the normal possibility, though. I, I really do like the idea of having that kind of ownership over your own house and living in that kind of because it also forces you to be in a community with the other people living in the house. Um, I've often contemplated too, how we kind of, I guess in a modern age, we kind of shove ourselves into these little cubicles, um, not just in work, like the conventional image of a business person going to their little cubicle desk, but more, more like how um, the, whenever you think of living on your own, you literally think of living in a, in a, basically in a box um, alone. Um, however, that box is configured, you're living on your own. And it's qu quite interesting how we, we purposefully, um, we, we've almost structurally, physically separated our social lives from our personal lives. Uh, when we go out with friends, we always say, I gotta go home. And what, that's basically code for, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go home so I'm not with you guys anymore and I'm by myself. Um, that's basically what you're saying. Um, <laughs> just a musing of mine, but it's, you're, you're actually saying that. You're actually saying, I, I don't want to be with you guys anymore. It was great, but I'm taking the night off for myself. Um, uh, but I think I think this kind of practice of doing service to the, <laughs> service for the community is good to kind of reconnect, reconnect. Because I think um, on the other side of the coin, and this, these would be my last few words that... Um, uh, whenever we say we're going to be, you know, whenever we ask um, about if somebody else is, is social or am I social enough, um, I think what we often think of is going for a drink with your friend or going to eat with somebody or just, um, and I think being social is more than that. I think being social is exactly what the Stoics had in mind when they thought of service or the circles. They thought of literally doing service for other people and connecting with others. Just a Abdul reminded me of what I wanted to say when he mentioned the private spaces. Abdul. Yeah, thanks. I think it's something uh, nice to do is um, going to uh, nursing homes. Uh, I, I don't know, are they called nursing homes where the elders are living together? 
correct me in the wrong. US I'm not I'm not sure about other languages yeah right yeah Tony uh, you know in the UK there's a uh, an agency called age UK yeah so uh, are they yeah. nursing home uh, can you classify it as nursing homes or something yeah else? so it's it, yeah. it's a community where elderly people will live together you know. yeah yeah Right, yeah. So what I really enjoy about is um, we had this um, voluntary uh, opportunity that we started um, back with uh, the university where we go every week, we educate um, elders on how to use technologies. So we go there and you cannot see, I can't tell you how, how pleasant to see their smiles. They really enjoy seeing new people, younger people and coming into their place and they enjoy having a nice chat with you. Um, so um, we do teach them how to use technologies and social media to um, c stay in touch with their loved ones. So uh, we call the movement is uh, or the um, initiative IT on the move. So we were going weekly and um, it was really, um, yeah, I couldn't express the joy we had in these uh, hours we spent with them. Um, they're really enjoying it and they're getting benefit out of it. So it's not just a basic chat, but rather something beneficial that they can use um, to communicate with their loved ones virtually because that's how the life is carried on nowadays. And so, yeah, we, we are um, integrating them into the modern world with the technologies, but at the same time, um, having a very friendly chat with them. I had the same opportunities back home, and yeah, it, it's it's really, um, yeah, it, it's hard to put uh, the right adjective for that, but it's really, um, um, yeah, I can find, I'm, I'm ra <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm speechless, but yeah, it, it's really great opportunity if you had it like go for it and yeah they, they'll be really welcoming that uh, for sure um no i think that that sounds like a really nice initiative and like you said like you're not just going there to chat you're literally giving them that something of value to take with them um, that they can then take with them for the rest of their lives. Um, and it's valuable even for people that old because they're not, you know, they're not necessarily looking for jobs. They're not necessarily looking for a place to live. Um, but uh, if they want to connect with family more often, um, you know, instead of using the telephone, they can use something on the internet. They can use email. They can use Facebook. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, I think it's a nice initiative to basically pull them into the cosmos. I think the other the other stoic the idea is that you're not like it's you are and you aren't at birth part of the cosmos. You are in the sense that you should be treated as a fellow human being and part of the cosmos, but you aren't in the sense that you have to kind of train yourself to be to be like the whole part of stoic training. This is what I got from Senec John Seller's article. This is like a good connection. Is that like you're not necessarily there at that stage where you're part of the cosmos yet. You're, you have to try and live virtuously. And the more virtuously and sage like you live, the more good you become, the more part of the cosmos you become. So it's like a process of development almost that you, the point of the practicing this concept is not just to practice and remind yourself, it's literally to become part of the cosmos because you're not already in a sense there yet. Um, I have to go. Um, I have to uh, um, still move a few things into my new apartment. Um, but um, you guys can continue. And this is in no way just telling you guys can you have to have to leave the conversation. So if you guys want to continue, um, uh, just as a reminder, so I made I already made the event and I made them public. Um, the next two weeks are in Marcus Aurelius. And the, the only reading we would necessarily ask you to do 
not necessarily in full, but read, read part of it or reread it if you read it already, is uh, Marcus Aurelius' Meditations. That's the only work for the next two weeks. So the next two weeks, we focus on Marcus Aurelius, and then we can move on from there. I think this is going to be a two-parter. I don't know if, if different people come in, in the two meetings or if, um, and I don't have an agenda. So I don't know if the first meeting will focus on a certain part of his character or his meditations and the other meeting will focus on something else. I, I don't know. This will be completely based on your questions. So also in the Telegram chat, post questions or interesting, maybe um, prompts or statements you would like to focus on in our discussion on Marcus Aurelius. It could be on him as a figure or it could be on his meditations. So it could be on either, either one, I think. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but his meditations are the only work he ever produced, right? The only work that was ever published by him. I mean, I don't think he intended uh, other people to read it, uh, so I wouldn't uh, call it published. Uh, yeah. Written, yeah. Um, I think so. Like, re regarding uh, stoicism mm -hmm. and his uh, thoughts about it. That's what I mean, yeah, regarding stoicism. Not, I mean, maybe he produced other diaries, um, but um, yeah, regarding stoicism, that's what I meant. That makes sense, though. I've never heard of any other work by him other than his meditations. Okay. Um, so thank you, everybody. Um, and I will see you, see you next week at 4 o'clock. Sure. And I will depart okay. at this juncture as well, chaps. Yeah. So have a good nice. Sunday. Okay, I'll see you next see you. week. You too. Cheers. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye. Cheers, folks. So, yeah, I guess we are closing. See you. Right. Yeah, see you, mate. All the Cheers, mate. Bye. Bye.